Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's webinar on the recently released report on development at U.S. airports, a summary look at future trends and opportunities. My name is Matt Griffin and I am the Director of Regulatory Affairs and Education at the Airport Consultants Council. I will be your host today. We are using GoToWebinar. We have muted you all upon entry. We ask that you remain muted throughout the presentation. We do encourage you to ask questions using the questions window on the right hand side of your screen. Please submit questions directly to the organizer as we proceed through the presentation. We will address as many as possible at the conclusion. Also, we will be providing a copy of the presentation to all of you who have attended in the next couple of days. And finally, please note that there may be a lag as we move through the presentation. We appreciate your patience. Our moderator today is the current chair of the ACC Board of Directors, Roddy Bogus. Roddy is the executive Vice President of Aviation at Suffolk Construction, where he is responsible for all aviation-related construction services. He assumed the position of Chair of the 2017 ACC Board of Directors in November 2016. Roddy has three decades of experience in design, planning, implementation, and management of diverse aviation projects globally. He is familiar with issues facing the airport and airline industry in the U.S., Europe, Latin and South America, the Middle East, and Africa. He is a regular speaker at industry conferences on topics that range from airport planning and design, security-related technologies, partnering to alternative financing, as well as the sometimes frequented satirical aviation industry author of Bogus Talk. Take it away, Roddy. Hey, thank you, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and let me take the opportunity to say thank you uh, to everyone for being a part of this webinar today. I know many of you may know that ACC has been looking at providing a report on the state of U.S. airports, uh, and we've been looking to do that for several years now for our membership. Many of our members, including me, are often looking for a resource that will help create strategic and tactical business plans to report back to our own corporations of where aviation is going and, and where the growth markets are. Um, in 2016, ACC approved some funds to commission just this kind of report. This report has been and continues to be championed by Carol Laurie, past chair of the ACC Board of Directors. Carol has been instrumental in, in the offering of the report you're going to hear about today. So ACC and Carol's key goals of this report, as you can see on the screen, are one, to determine the current and projected level of investment in airports. Two, determine the types of those projects, how they're going to be funded, how they will be funded, and, and what types of services will these projects need, what's being anticipated, so that you and I can look forward and, and kind of schedule where we think we need to be. And number three, compare airport development with other sectors. You know, how's it working out? So ACC advertised this, the RFP for this report in August of 2016, and AREP was a, awarded the report. The report was released on February 21st of this year and introduced at the ACC AAAE Planning Design and Construction Symposium in New Orleans. So let's get to the report, shall we? You're going to hear today from the report's authors, Mark Ahazek and Matthew Sharon, both of Arab. Uh, while, the, while their bios are on the screen, I'm going to read from it. Uh, Mark is an associate and senior aviation consultant at Arab. He has expertise in airline and airport operation and management terminal and airside planning, airport capacity and capital planning, operational efficiency analysis, and project manage it, management. Uh, likewise, Matthew is a planner in the New York office of AREP. He has been involved in planning and transportation projects primarily throughout the New York and New Jersey region. His skills include planning research, analysis, spreadsheet models, system operations, and GIS. So Mark, why don't you take us to the report, please? Thanks very much, Roddy, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, we're going to um, speak for uh, about 30 minutes, go through a number of slides here, and, uh, and then we'll open it up for some questions and answers at the end. And I think, as was mentioned, feel free to type in those questions as we go along. Um, but to begin, just wanted to give you an introduction, tell a little bit about what we've done. Um, so you know, the ACC engaged us to do a, a research effort and to summarize it in a white paper um, that it was intended to address the following uh, questions. You know, what are the key trends uh, in airport development here in the U.S., primarily looking out over the next half decade? Um, which projects 
um, can we expect over those next five years? And what level of investment will those projects bring? Um, and for members and others who were involved in airport development, what are the opportunities? Uh, you know, looking forward, what types of projects? I'm looking at categories such as terminal, airside, landside, access. Um, what sorts of funding are the main funding mechanisms uh, for these projects? Federal, uh, other, uh, any sort of private funding? Procurement methods. Are we going to see more P3s? Are we going to see more in the way of traditional design, bid, build procurement? And obviously for members, you're probably all wondering what are the required consultant services that airports are looking for? Um, so before we go further, I just want to give a shout out and thank the, uh, the entire ACC review team uh, for their continuous guidance and feedback throughout. And also, as we'll tell you about in a little bit, um, we did a number of interviews with airport leaders around the country. And I really want to thank uh, those folks for, for really offering their very candid thoughts on, on where development is going and some good suggestions uh, for the future. So our next slide talks to methodology. Um, the research effort that we, uh, we launched on uh, took place over a two-month period, and we looked at, at different sizes of airports differently. So first we took a look at the 60 large and medium hubs, and we did that on a project-specific basis, and we did a sample of about 50 of those 60 large and medium hubs, and we captured every single project that they're contemplating doing over the next five years. We used capital improvement programs and other airport reports, such as budget documents. We reviewed FAA grant lists. Um, and we also looked at public articles. Obviously, there's a lot out in the media talking about airport development projects, and, and we really interrogated those. For the, uh, the smaller airports, the hubs, the non-hubs, and the non-primaries, we focused largely on the, the NIFIS investment needs study that the FAA published at the end of last year, the 2017 to 2021 report. And our analysis of those investment needs focused largely on a, a benchmarking exercise, looking at uh, the investment requirements compared to employment at the airports and also the air traffic movements. And for the GA airports, we did a sample of the GA airports and we did some research looking at various state system plans to understand development projects at those GA airports. Um, and lastly, as I mentioned, the airport leader interviews were very, very helpful. Um, and really getting some, some candid um, commentary on trends at those people's airports, but also at other airports they know of, and some really great ideas for, for consulting needs of the future. So headline-wise, this slide uh, really captures you know, the top 10 findings um, that came out of the research. Uh, number one, over the next half decade, the, the biggest investment dollar-wise is going to be in, in terminals. Uh, terminal development, new terminals and renovations, uh, largely driven by the need to enhance capacity. Uh, number two, um, you know, like painting a bridge, you've always got to do it. Airfield pavement projects are ubiquitous and always going on. Um, most are rehabilitative in nature. And what's interesting is there are very few new runway projects planned over the next half decade. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, number three, the NIPIS um, identified investment uh, totaled nearly $33 billion in projects that are eligible for federal funding. Um, many of those at some of the smaller airports, but certainly a good share uh, of investment. Number four, design build and the, the construction manager at risk procurement models, the CM at risk, are very much gaining interest and gaining popularity uh, amongst airports in states where they're available. And we'll talk a bit more about that. Number five, P3s are starting to gain some traction uh, here in the US. Um, still very few airport-wide P3s, but there are definitely more and more component P3s where a portion of the airport is sold off to the private sector. Uh, six, um, airports, airline tenants, federal agencies are really starting to, to very much use technology and use innovation to enhance passenger facilitation and to make the most of existing capacity. Um, seven, CONRAC facilities, definitely more and more of them, and they're becoming more substantial in nature. They're almost becoming mini airport terminals in themselves. Eight, airports are definitely investing uh, in the passenger experience, ways to enhance that, 
and studies have very much shown that increased passenger satisfaction um, drives higher passenger spend. So there's definitely a business case in terms of investing in the passenger experience. Nine, and this is a very new trend, the, the transportation network companies, the TNCs like Uber, um, are, are really evolving landside behavior. And airports that we spoke with indicated that they're starting to think about needing to change uh, facility landside planning and also landside operations to deal with this new, new mode. And then number 10, the GA airports in large part are focusing, focusing their investment on upgrading existing facilities and state of good repair initiatives to keep the facilities in good shape. So we identified four major trends or trend categories um, that I'll take you through at this point. The first being runways and safety. Uh, an interesting statistic, I and mean, we have this perception in the U.S. that uh, very few new runways can be built or have been built. But if you look over the past 20 years, um, 17 of the 30 large hubs have benefited from new runways um, over those two decades. Um, the remaining airports that, uh, of the large hubs that, that haven't had a new runway are frankly those with the biggest barriers to new runways, places like Newark and, and JFK and, and Washington National. Um, the future really over the next five years uh, features very few new runways. Obviously, the O'Hare Modernization Program is planning uh, an additional runway, and Charlotte's in the EIS process for a fourth parallel runway. But beyond that, there's not much amongst the big hubs. Um, as the RSA Improvement Program was really focused, uh, or a lot of airports were focused on that up through 2015, over the next five years, the FAA is going to have a lot of focus on the Runway Incursion Mitigation Program, the RIM. Uh, which is aimed at improving non-standard airfield geometry and improving airfield safety. And so that will be something that those of us who are in the industry definitely want to pay attention to. Uh, the lower left passenger facilitation, um, one of the big themes is airports are dealing with the need to enhance capacity. And airports are very much interested in figuring out how to use existing infrastructure and use existing capacity more efficiently so that they end up spending less capex on, on new capacity. Um, so things like the innovation lanes that we're starting to see at security checkpoints, which result in a much higher throughput, and the TSA's uh, potential to screen for intent are definitely making better uh, use of our security checkpoints. Obviously, the innovation lanes here in the US have started to, to take off over the last year, very much funded by uh, airlines investing in that, in that new uh, technology. Um, new models of check-in and self-service continue. Um, Self-bag tagging has, has uh, really started to take off here in the U.S. Um, we have the opportunity to work with, uh, with JetBlue on their new self-tagging model, uh, which they've rolled out at uh, JFK, uh, San Juan, Fort Lauderdale, and Boston. Quite an interesting concept, and we think that that's the, the future uh, in terms of self-tagging. Um, and then the concept of inside-out terminal design uh, with a passenger focus. This is something that we heard uh, from a number of the airport leaders. And this is the concept of looking to, to really design terminals around passenger needs and, and function first, then bringing in appearance and the architecture uh, kind of as the second wave. Um, the upper right changes in fleet mix. I think we all know that the, the A380 is, is really um, leveled off in terms of deliveries. Um, not many more have been ordered. Uh, most of the large hubs in the U.S. are now able to accommodate the A380. Uh, Chicago, O'Hare, and Boston, Logan being the most recent to have facilities for the A380. So very much limited growth in that group six uh, super category. However, if you look to the, uh, the next generation uh, mid-sized wide bodies, the 787s, the A350s, those order books continue to grow. And those aircraft really are innovating and in, in opening up many new markets uh, here in the U.S. So um, in places like Austin with the uh, British Airways Heathrow nonstop service, places like San Diego with some new Trans-Pacific nonstops, and obviously Boston, which many know has gained a tremendous amount of intercontinental service thanks to these new aircraft, um, are really um, in need of upgraded facilities to handle uh, international traffic, international passengers. And then going down to the even smaller gauge, 
the 737 MAX, which Norwegian will be launching transatlantic service with later this year, and the A320 NEO family um, is going to be growing intercontinental service at, at smaller airports like Stewart, like Providence, like Oakland, uh, and, and those facilities as well will need enhanced FIS facilities and, and greater facilities for international service. So that's something that um, is definitely a trend. And then elaborating on the, the transportation network companies um, a trend that I mentioned a bit earlier, um, definitely seeing drastic shifts in mode share uh, over to the TNCs, and they're very much changing uh, landside characteristics, volumes. Um, our experience at Arup working with the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey here in New York, um, definitely a lot of pressure on the curbs at Kennedy, uh, Newark, and, and LaGuardia as well uh, due to Uber, Lyft, and other TNCs. Um, and so airports are really um, in need of a re-examination of landside operations, landside planning, uh, curb length, uh, and it's really a paradigm change. There may also be some implications on, uh, on CONRAC facilities going forward given, given the TNCs. Now our next series of slides uh, talks to uh, the NIPIS, uh, and this is the FAA's uh, report that's published every two years looking at um, what they believe the AIP, the federal investment required for infrastructure development at the roughly 3,000 NIPIS airports. And for those of you who don't know the acronym, NIPIS is the National Plan of integrated airport systems. Um, what's very interesting, the, the report that was published late last year, which is the fiscal year 17 through 21 report, um, shows a total investment requirement of 32.5 billion um, over that five-year period. Um, what's interesting is that that's actually down from the report that two years ago, which totaled 33.5 billion and down significantly from, from the peak uh, report, which was back in 2011, where the FAA said there was a, an investment requirement of $52.3 billion. And I wanted to clarify that um, federal uh, projects or the, the investment requirements solely include the AIP funding, so PFC-funded projects are not included in here. Um, and I think the other, the other thing to point out is that this amount um, is not likely to be the actual spend over the next five years, but we see this as a proxy for airport development investment over the next five years. Really a good um, uh, sense of what likely to be spent AIP-wise. Going back to 2009, if you look at the NIPIS report uh, that was published that year, there were four main categories uh, of project types. Uh, reconstruction, standards, capacity, and terminal projects. If you fast forward to today and to the much lower volume of total uh, investment requirement, we're only uh, seeing two main categories, the reconstruction and the standard. The capacity and the terminal uh, categories have dropped off significantly. And so if you look at those two uh, leading categories, the reconstruction and the standard, they make up 64% of the NIPIS uh, requirement. Um, so obviously reconstruction, uh, looking at uh, upgrading uh, uh, airfields, uh, looking at upgrading terminals, and obviously standards, um, and, and RIM is going to be a big part of that over the next half decade. Now funding and delivery trends, um, this is particularly interesting because we see this as an evolving uh, uh, theme. Uh, the traditional procurement method for airports design, bid, build. Is, is definitely losing a popularity to the design-build model. Um, I will caveat that by saying that design-bid-build um, is still in use for smaller, less complex, um, often airport design projects. So if it's a very vanilla, uh, straightforward project, airports are more inclined to do the traditional procurement model. But if it's something more complex, like a terminal uh, or like a, uh, an air cargo campus, design build or CM at risk becomes more popular. Uh, for those who don't know, um, design build and CM at risk um, offer a number of benefits uh, to an airport. Um, things such as expedited schedule, getting a project delivered faster, uh, reducing the risk for the airport or the operator uh, is another benefit of doing design build. Um, getting a better project 
at a lower cost is also a benefit. And, and again, the theme here with design build is you get the designer and you get the construction manager together as a team up front. So they're both at the table very early on in the, in the project. <clears throat> if you look at the, um, the left-hand map, the green map, which is from the Design Build Institute of America, this indicates uh, states where design build procurement is allowed by law. Uh, the dark states uh, are ones where design build is permitted by all agencies of all types for design and construction. And at the other end of the extreme, the, the gray states, and there are only three of them here, Wisconsin, Iowa, and North Dakota, um, are states where design build is limited to one political subdivision agency or project. So the headline here is that design build is really authorized in many states, and that is fueling the increase in popularity uh, amongst airports. Now, P3s, and you're definitely hearing that acronym more and more. As I mentioned earlier, um, airport-wide P3s are still quite limited. We had experience with, uh, with the San Juan privatization uh, back about five years ago under the FAA pilot program. Since then, there haven't been any other airport-wide P3s. What has been growing in popularity are these component P3s, where an airport will look to privatize perhaps a terminal, a conrack, uh, an airport transit system, a component of the airport. And we're seeing more and more examples of this. The Denver Great Hall, uh, which is ongoing, that project is, is a component of the terminal. Obviously, the LaGuardia Central Terminal Building is probably the most high-profile airport P3. The Austin South Terminal uh, that recently uh, went privatized, and various cargo developments around the country. Um, if you look at the right hand, the purple map, this shows uh, state laws where, which allow public-private partnerships. And unlike design bill, there's definitely less penetration across the country. So the dark purple uh, are states where P3s are widely authorized. Uh, there are only about uh, 10 states that fall into that category. And again, again, the gray indicates states where P3s are not authorized. Um, now you're probably, some of you are probably looking at the map and wondering why New York is gray given that I mentioned that the LaGuardia Central Terminal Building P3 is probably the, the most high-profile one. Well, that's actually due to the fact that the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey here is not subject to the New York State restriction on P3. So they have the ability to use this, this new uh, procurement model. Now, I mentioned that the large and medium hub projects, uh, we did this research on an airport-specific and project-specific basis. And this is really where, where we did the detailed uh, research, uh, and we went quite deep and looked at about 50 of the 60 large and medium hub airports. Uh, the results of our research are summarized in a very, very detailed spreadsheet um, for which you have a screenshot here. The spreadsheet is actually available on ACC's website at acconline.org. Um, and we really see it as a very useful roadmap, almost a radar screen in terms of opportunities over the next five years. So if you're an ACC member, uh, if you're not a member, if you're involved in airport development, or even if you're an airport, uh, we think it's a very helpful tool to get a sense of what's going on over the next half decade. And what you'll see from the screenshot here, the, the categories or the columns of data, um, you know, we've got project name, we've got a good description of the project. We coded each project uh, according to a category, uh, which I'll describe in a second. Um, we indicate when the project's going to start, when it's likely to end, current stage, obviously the, the estimated project costs, um, how it's likely to be funded, uh, bonds, federal funding, uh, private investment, what the procurement type might be of those I just described, what's motivating the project. So is this being motivated by a regulatory requirement? Is it being motivated by a, a need to enhance capacity? And then uh, of particular interest to ACC members is we, we, for each project, we, we took a look and we said, what are the likely consulting services that each airport is going to need for that particular project? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes. Now, each research project, as I mentioned, was coded according to a project category. So the left-hand bar chart uh, is, is, a, is a depiction of, of each of those categories. 
And, um, and again, this is for large and medium hub airports. And the percentage of the total spend of investment for each of these categories. And what you can see here, and it's quite interesting, 70% of the development investment is going to be in terminals. So the dark blue uh, pie piece is uh, new terminals, and the, uh, the, the, the brown piece is the terminals that are either renovated or expanded. Now this uh, roughly 70% of the pie also includes a number of component projects like security screening improvements, uh, baggage handling upgrades, those were all included in the, uh, in the terminal projects. And just to give a couple of examples, there are definitely a number of uh, big ticket uh, terminal projects underway or planned for the next five years. It includes LaGuardia, which totals eight and a half billion in uh, terminal investment between the new central terminal building and Delta's new terminal C and D. Nearly three billion at Salt Lake City. Uh, San Francisco is uh, investing roughly 2.4 billion in the new uh, boarding area A. Newark's new terminal A is about 2.3 billion. San Diego's terminal one, 2.3 billion. And then obviously there are major terminal renovations planned at LAX by Delta and others, Atlanta and Portland. Um, going down from terminals, you'll see the next category, airport access, makes up about 10% of the large and medium hub investment over the next decade. One of the biggest airport access projects is the, uh, the LAX uh, Landside Modernization Program, which includes a $2.7 billion APM system, Automated People Mover. Uh, the next category, CONRAC, which is about 5%. Um, is becoming more and more significant. LAX is part of that LAMP program that I mentioned is, is planning a billion dollar CONRAC and Chicago here has an $800 million uh, CONRAC plan. Um, and then the next categories under that making up in total about 8% of the investment are, are the pavement projects with the large and medium hubs. Split roughly 50-50 between uh, rehabilitation projects and new pavement projects. Again, Every airport's doing them. Uh, they need to be done uh, pretty much continuously. But in terms of spend, they really don't make up much of the pie. And you'll see the other projects, infrastructure, utilities, ancillary facilities, state of good repair, uh, down to uh, the, the single digits. What's motivating the projects at the large and medium hubs in general? 72% uh, are being motivated by the need to enhance and increase capacity to keep up with traffic and passenger growth. Uh, roughly a quarter are upgrade, refresh, state of good repair, maintenance type projects. And then uh, basically 2% are other types of projects. Um, so again, we're keeping up with uh, the tremendous growth of traffic, passengers, and, and movement. Now I mentioned that we coded um, each and every large and medium hub project and assessed the likely consulting services required of that project. And this is a table that summarizes our assessment of, of that. So as I mentioned earlier, the, the large and medium hub investment is roughly $70 billion over the next five years. And just to give you an example, the first row, the discipline being engineering services, we determined that roughly uh, 512 of the 534 planned projects um, will require some form of engineering service. Uh, those 512 projects total 68.8 billion of the 69.8 billion in total investment, so that's 98 percent of the projects. And you'll see uh, the top four categories are engineering, construction, planning services, architectural services, and then it really drops off from there. Um, the other services, IT, security, baggage, environmental, rail, financial, are needed in, in, in a lot less total projects. Uh, but they're definitely services that are needed uh, across the large and medium hubs. And then looking down to the, uh, the small uh, and the, and the non-hubs and the non-primary airports, um, of the small hubs, and I think I'll talk about those first, uh, you know, we, we used the NIFIS data again, uh, and we did a benchmark of the NIFIS investment requirement against passenger volume. And of the small hubs, uh, five airports filtered up to the top, and those were Des Moines, Greensboro, Little Rock, Memphis, and Providence, showing the most 
uh, investment needs uh, for, for similar sized airports. Um, you know, of the GA airports, um, we're seeing the sector that sees the most investment is the corporate aviation sector uh, and, and the larger GA airports that cater to that corporation, the corporate aviation sector. So if you look at uh, airports, uh, GA airports that have a, a requirement for over $50 million in investment over the next five years, there were only eight airports that had that $50 million greater need. And those were Teterboro, Van Nuys, Kansas City downtown, Paul Waukee and DuPage outside of Chicago, Kankakee, Fort Lauderdale Executive, and Quonset in Rhode Island. So obviously very well-known uh, airports that cater to the corporate aviation sector driving the biggest investment needs. Smaller GA airports, obviously a lot less in terms of investment. Most are having to spend on state of good repair uh, and update projects. But we note that there are definitely systematic problems at the, at the lower end of the GA market uh, with uh, obviously fewer, fewer aircraft and a reduction in pilots. Uh, in general, two-thirds of GA spending uh, is for pavement projects, uh, not, not a surprising statistic. Uh, the next highest category of GA is, is ancillary facilities at about 11% of the spend, ancillary facilities being uh, facilities such as hangars and fuel farms. So in closing, I wanted to bring you back to, um, to the, uh, the top 10 headline slides. But I think in, in general, uh, capital needs and opportunities are substantial uh, for our nation's Air Force. They're definitely evolving with technology and new things like uh, transportation network companies. But the, but the focus in general remains on, on passenger-facing projects for the bigger airports, those things such as terminals, Conrack, et cetera and pavement for the, the smaller facilities. Um, you know, over the next half decade, airports are undertaking aggressive and substantial capital improvement programs. I think that's a good thing for all of us on the line here today over the next five years. And these programs are going to represent many opportunities for airport consultants and others uh, available, and uh, others who participate in airport development. So with that, I'd like to conclude and, and thank you for your time today. I'm going to tip it back to Roddy. Uh, for a couple of closing remarks, and then we'll open it up for questions. Hey, thank you, Mark. Uh, I know that I speak for Carol and the entire ACC uh, organization when I say how happy and how proud we are to have this report to share with the members of ACC and the members of industry. Uh, so now you are no doubt wondering where you can get your hands on this report for your own use. Uh, if you'd like to download and own your own copy of development at U.S. airports, uh, a summary look at future trends and opportunities. I can help you with that. Uh, just point your browser to the ACC website at www.acconline.org. All you have to do is scroll down about halfway down the page, and under News, you will find a link to this report. From this link, you can download the report and the associated project listing spreadsheet. Please note that there is a charge for this spreadsheet for non-ACC members, so please make sure you are logged in as a member in order to download the spreadsheet with no charge. And, and let's face it, you, you saw just a little bit of that, and this spreadsheet is like a giant jump start for 534 aviation pursuits for the next five years. You know, you know, this is invaluable stuff. So now, we want your feedback. If you look at this, is it valuable to you? Is it useful? and how have you used it, how will you use it? Uh, what other information would you like to see in future reports? Uh, at ACC, we want to continue to offer relevant information to our members, and to do that, we need to know what you're looking for. So please use this link to give us your feedback um, at www.surveymonkey.com slash r slash a bunch of crazy characters, which you're not writing down. Uh, just look at it on your screen there. And uh, we would love for you to give us some feedback uh, through SurveyMonkey on this report, how you've used it, what you'd like to see in the future. Now we're going to go to questions. Don't forget to use the chat box. Uh, we've had some questions roll in uh, while, the, while the presentation was going on, but it's a good, good chance now to go ahead and get those in. We want to also thank you for your participation today. Uh, so remember, you can log your questions in using the chat box for the webinar. So we've got a ser several questions, and, and some of these may be answered by Mark and Matt. Uh, some of them we may call on the expertise of, of TJ. 
Uh, and the first one, um, I guess, guys, is uh, has the TNC market had any impacts on Conrack? And did you get that feeling while you were researching the market? So this is Matthew. Um, so the answer is maybe. Um, any of the Conrack numbers and the Conrack plans that we have were taken directly from the airports and the documents that they've published. Now, it could be that, that in their plans for Conrack, at the same time, they're going to take a much more holistic look at, at everything that's happening on the curbs, on their access roadways, and they may decide to, to either expand or, or lower the size of their planned CONRAC. But I think the CONRAC motivator in general is, is much more of a land use concern, and where instead of having a zillion rental car lots, some of them in good locations, some of them in, some of them in bad locations, you can consolidate all of them onto a single parcel open up additional airport land for other revenue possibilities. And a CONRAC is also fundable through, through franchise fees. And so it's a piece of infrastructure that you can build that has that is a good definitive timeline for, for return on investment. And the airport can make its money back on that construction much more easily than they can make it back on, say, another off-ramp or expanding new roadways, which have, you know, general societal benefits, but nobody is actually paying for it directly. Okay, good. Um, and we know that a lot of people are concerned with that. Um, we talked a lot in this, and, and you made mention to PFCs and, and AIPs and the NIPIAs. Uh, what I don't recall is uh, talking about how much work is being done through the airlines themselves instead of through the airport directly. Any Any thoughts on that? Did I miss that? Yeah, no, and, and Roddy, it's Mark. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely jump on that one. I have some, some airline experience in my background. Um, it's a larger hub. There's definitely an increasing, uh, you know, propensity for airlines to be investing in facilities, particularly terminal facilities. You see that uh, in a lot of the airports like Kennedy, LAX, where there are unit terminal buildings and airlines are looking to develop those facilities, expand those facilities. Obviously here in New York, Delta, uh, JetBlue, United um, have spent billions uh, on their own facilities. Um, but you're also seeing that in, in, in some of the, uh, the, the less large hub airports. Think of Southwest down at Houston Hobby investing in their own FIS facilities. So that's definitely a growing trend in terms of airports investing in, in facilities that they uh, end up controlling at the end of the day. And a trend probably as long as they continue to make money. That's a good point. When profits are flowing, they're, they're definitely willing to expend in, in, uh, in bricks and mortar. Um, now this question next, uh, Mark, Matt, I don't know which one, how you guys want to handle it, or maybe it's a TJ one as well, but it's kind of a policy question. Um, can you touch upon the impact to aviation security uh, from uh, Trump's proposed cuts to the TSA budget. Yeah, how does that work in here? TJ, would you like to handle that one? Sure, yeah, this is TJ Schultz, president of ACC, and just lurking here in the background. But um, I think we had a couple of questions on the Trump uh, skeletal budget, or skinny budget, I guess is what we should call it, that was released today. And I think at the end of the day, there's, um, this is very, very high level, and there's an awful lot of detail that we just don't know at this time. Um, it does seem apparent that um, the TSA does take a hit in the uh, Trump budget proposal, primarily uh, reducing the Viper uh, teams um, at, at airports and also reducing grants for lo local law enforcement as well and reducing or possibly eliminating behavior detection officers as well. Although the, TS, although the budget document does say that the overall budget will strengthen screening at airport security checkpoints. So again, there's a whole lot of questions remaining as to what the specific budget implications are for um, security projects. And turning to the US DOT, Department of Transportation, uh, it does, the overall department does appear to receive a, a, a massive hit in reductions. Uh, how that impacts FAA, uh, first and foremost, the AIP program should be held harmless. That is funded through user fees and uh, operates under contract authority. 
So similar to highway grants, um, AIP should not be impacted by any budget numbers. I also think that the uh, tr Trump administration would be hard pressed to have substantial reductions in the FAA operations account because that would mean cutting back on uh, air traffic control officers. And the last time we saw that happen was a few years ago when sequestration um, kicked in and a number of air traffic controllers either had to reduce their time and we saw some very significant delays in the airspace system. So I don't think they're going to make massive cuts in operations. So I really believe that leaves uh, the FAA facilities and equipment account, which funds a lot of air traffic control uh, equipment and things like that. It, it, research could also potentially take a hit. So we're going to have to keep a close eye on that. Um, so at the end of the day, broad-based uh, policy and budgetary levels outlined by the Trump administration, we don't know the details. I do think that a lot of the proposals included in here might not float in Congress, uh, even with this Republican Congress. So again, stay tuned and we'll, we'll be having updates as the budget gets launched and the 2018 appropriations gets underway. Thanks, TJ. So I'm going I'm to go, I've got three questions here that kind of go from large to, to small airports. We'll kind of take them in that order. Um, I assume that, that you talked about design, build, and CMR becoming more popular. Uh, I assume that, that both of these and P3 uh, are probably more popular at large airports with design, bid, build still being more prevalent at smaller and GA airports. Uh, did you get that sense, or is this trend toward design, build, and CMR uh, even make making the run at smaller and GA airports? Yeah, I mean, in general, the, the design build, the P3, the CM at risk um, are definitely beneficial at the larger airports because they're most beneficial for very complex, uh, high volume, um, high ticket uh, projects. Uh, as, as I mentioned, smaller projects that are more repetitive, uh, that are simple, that are often airport design are just you know, best to, to procure via the traditional design bid build model. Having said that, we did speak with a number of, uh, of leaders at the smaller airports, and they're definitely keen on looking to design build, looking at CM at risk um, as a way to, to streamline and reduce their own risk uh, with some of these simpler projects. So right now it is the bigger airports, but I think it's starting to trickle down and become popular with some of the smaller airports as well. Roddy, so Mark and Matt, it, it, oh, go ahead, TJ, I'm sorry. If I may patch in, I think one of the largest inhibitors as it relates to uh, use of design build or CM at risk at smaller airports is the fact that in, may, in most cases, federal aviation AIP dollars are used. And under AIP procedures, they do allow for design build and CM at risk. But at the end of the day, I just haven't seen a, a large uptick in interest um, by airports to undertake this, and, and particularly by the FAA. I think uh, a, a number of folks at FAA are, are uh, much more familiar with the design bid build process. Uh, that said, I, I do think there, there is interest. Uh, we just need to figure out how to uh, work with FAA to kind of navigate these projects a, a little better. It's, uh, it's definitely evolving. I'll say that. Yeah. We all I'm have Matt, on, on the spreadsheet, I, and I didn't look, does it give an idea of what the delivery process may be, or is it sans that information? Yeah, it, it, as best we could, uh, there is a cate category in terms of procurement model. As best we could, if we had information that, that specified the procurement model, we definitely added it to the, that project's role. Um, well, so uh, you definitely see that yeah. So let's take this a little further. Uh, there, there was a question that was brought up, is, is the public process for design build the same as design bid build? And I think transparency in the submittal process, you know, such as is a sponsor obligated to go with a low bid package, or can they pick a team that's more compatible with the sponsor but costs more? Uh, did you get any feel for that in, in this survey? Yeah, and I, I think definitely one of the things we heard with, with design bill that there's, there's a big element in terms of community outreach. We heard this very uh, clearly from, from our uh, interview with, uh, with uh, San Francisco International, that there's a desire as part of design bill not only to get the, the CM involved early on, 
but to get the community and other stakeholders involved early on during the conceptual design to make sure that all of their views and, and needs are baked into the design. Um, and I think, I think the other part of the question was, and Roddy, correct me if I'm wrong, is the airport obligated to, to go with the, the lowest bid versus maybe someone who has a higher bid? Was that the question? Yeah, I think they were. Just, I think the question was: Is you know, design build is it still all just low bid? You know, like like design build bid, or is design build more of a qualification based as opposed to just strictly being low bid? Yeah, it's not necessarily low bid. I mean, qualifications based selection was definitely a trend that we heard from the interviews. Airports are definitely using that. Um, so the, I think my understanding is that there's no obligation to go with the lowest bidder. Um, and they have an opportunity to pick someone who has a, a more innovative uh, or more applicable design or a better team in, in their mind. Okay, and then uh, kind of going down on the GA side, and I'm not sure exactly where this question goes, so if, if I say this wrong, whoever sent it in, if you provide some clarification, uh, the question was, what about Willow Run Airport, you know, y, YIP, the GA Reliever Airport? Um, so, what about it? So, um, so while we were speaking, I, I did take a look at the spreadsheet, and there was, uh, there was 26 million identified in investment at uh, Ypsilanti. Um, you know, obviously, it's a it's a busy GA reliever airport. There is a major tenant in uh, Kalita that, that that's on the field there that that, that obviously invests in their own facilities. Um, but in terms of, of actually federally um, AIP money, there was that 26 million identified for there, which is which is below that 50 million threshold where, where we picked out those you know, eight or nine most invested GA airports. Okay, good. Um, the question came in and said, the, the summary of the number of projects and the cost for the projects, uh, does that include land and air side or just land side projects? It, 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 it's across the board. So um, I'm assuming that was regarding uh, the large and medium hubs uh, and, and, and depth. Yeah, so definitely across the board. I mean, it included uh, airport access pro uh, projects. It included airfield projects. It included uh, terminal projects. It included ancillary. It was essentially any project that was featured over the next half decade in an airport's capital improvement program. So it was all all encompassing. Um, any trend that you saw for air cargo? You know, it's, the comment was facilities seem to have been pretty stale since the recession. So while there was, you know, what, roughly 68%, I think, focused on terminal and terminal refreshing, what do you find for air cargo, if anything? So air cargo has a couple of things about it. First of all, the major air cargo providers are obviously private. So, so they're the ones who are going to be investing heavily in their own hub and their own facilities. But at the same time, you also have a handful of, of major passenger hubs in the center part of the country your Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Memphis, well, Memphis was already a cargo hub, um, at, or St. Louis, where, where you have a very large airport with lots of runway capacity that has often a lot of, of aeronautical land that's, that's on the premises that now offer an opportunity to set up a cargo hub. And you see that with, um, I think it's uh, um, um, Amazon and DHL are setting something up in Cincinnati now that you have all that excess capacity and, and three widely spaced parallel runways and no more Comair RJs to, to, to give you an operation every 30 seconds. So there is certainly an opportunity for air cargo. Um, and then again, you know, as, as Amazon and, and Jet, which is now owned by Walmart, you know, are, are popularizing this model of you can get anything anywhere within 24 hours, there is obviously going to be some sort of demand for increased air cargo. And I think that, that certain airports are going to be very well placed to deliver on, on those demands to consumers. Okay, good. A similar question, did you find any trends uh, maybe outside of cargo for large ind industrial aviation related projects, you know, like new aircraft production facilities, et cetera? So for, for aircraft production facilities, those tend to be um, primarily driven by, by local tax and business incentives. You know, I'm thinking of things like, like the Eclipse plant in, in Albuquerque, which was a huge investment by the state of New Mexico, or the uh, Icon factory in, I think it's uh, Vacaville, California, um, right outside of Sacramento. 
that, that again, was a big local tax increase. I don't think there's very much federal investment that's going in towards toward building new industrial manufacturing facilities, again, because these are all you know, benefiting private owners. But it is certainly an opportunity that, that certain local economic development authorities are, are keeping tabs on and are, and are acting upon it when, when they see an opportunity or an interest. So good point. This, this survey that, that you undertook is, the, is a public side survey and doesn't necessarily represent uh, the private investment. Is that a fair statement? Yes, correct. Okay. This this next question, and I hope I do it justice here. Um, so so help me out. Very curious if if there is an uptick in new customer service departments, and did you notice if their initiatives are more focused on bricks and mortar, or are we seeing more disruptive solutions? Uh, certainly appears to be a lot of opportunities, but procurement strategies remain difficult to determine. There seems like there's two or three questions in there. Uh, can you can you take a stab at that? Yeah, you know, I, I will say that we we definitely heard a lot about the passenger experience and customer service in uh, you know our interviews. That airports are really starting to realize that that is important. Uh, that, that passengers are not just the airline's passengers, but that, that they're the airport's passengers, and that a happier passenger going through your airport is one who's likely going to spend more. So there's definitely an emphasis there. Uh, surveying and, and understanding the needs and the desires of passengers is increasing. Um, and, and I think they're focused on both. They're focused on bricks and mortar improvements. And I'll give an example across the river here at Newark, uh, you know, the OTG group. Uh, as a concessionaire invested, I think, $100 million in the build-out of brand new food and beverage, very high-end new food and beverage facilities in, in Continentals or, excuse me, United's Terminal C. Um, and so that's an example of bricks and mortar really going to improve customer service. But there's also been a lot of emphasis on technology and looking at ways to reduce queue time to provide information on queue wait time to passengers because if they know that it's going to be only 15 minutes and you can tell them that, they'll be less anxious and more comfortable. Um, so you know, operational and technology improvements like that um, are definitely being uh, rolled out by airports. Um, so hopefully that answered the, uh, the question. Good. So I've got two questions. I'm going to leave you with, with one quick one. Uh, the, the question was, are, are you familiar with the ASCE infrastructure report uh, recently put out by civil engineers? And if so, uh, can you comment on that infrastructure grade given by the ASCE specific to aviation and their big push for funding, you know, noting the lack of? And is there any new information of infrastructure budget for the new administration? This kind of goes back a little bit, TJ, what you were talking to. Yeah, so to be honest, I, I, I saw the press release and I heard a you know news story on the on, on the morning radio a couple of days ago about our uh, D plus infrastructure, um, but I, I haven't um, had the time this week to to really delve into the report, um, nor did I see what the specific aviation grade was. Um, as far as their their push for funding um, and and new administration and new information in the budget, you know if. if if I knew that, I wouldn't be an airport planner. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, TJ. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, if, if, I guess one thing in particular is uh, to note that ACI released its updated capital needs survey, uh, which showed a hundred million dollars. Uh, I'm sorry, hundred million, a uh, hundred billion dollars in airport capital needs across the country. Uh, we we. Um, discussed our report with ACI and found that there's quite a bit of uh, awful lot of alignment as it relates to our findings uh, with the mid uh, and larger hubs and their report findings as well. As it relates to the overall, um, you know, the ASCE report and the grade and the FAA reauthorization bill and eventual funding, I think one thing hanging over all this is exactly what this one trillion dollar infrastructure package looks like. How is it going to be funded, and in particular, what are the expectations or the expected role of the private sector in delivering that? Right now, I really don't know what is driving what as it relates to do we need to have that full infrastructure package identified and then move on to the FAA reauthorization, or do we start with the FAA reauthorization and then go to the 
you know, infrastructure package. I'm not quite sure what's going to come first. Uh, so again, stay tuned for, for more details. That sounds like a whole other webinar. Okay, last question, Matt Mark. Um, what was the most surprising finding uh, from your research? Uh, and and, and if, if this is the case, what issue or data point would you like to have done more research on? Yeah, you know, I think I think frankly the, the most surprising thing was um, you know hearing from from airport leaders, um, you know that that the customer experience, the passenger experience, is really becoming important, and they're seeing that as a as a way to definitely drive incremental revenue. So I think from our standpoint, there's there's a lot of interest in exactly what airports, uh, terminal operators, and airlines can do. To, to make the airport experience better. You know, what can they do from a, an operational standpoint? What can they do from a facility standpoint? I think there's a tremendous opportunity, particularly here in the United States, to improve the airport experience. And um, the door-to-door -door journey, I mean, from getting it, you know, dropped off at the curb to walking through that, uh, that jet bridge onto the aircraft. I think there's a lot to do, and I think that'd be a great area to dig deeper and, and really you know, look at some best practices and make some suggestions for what airports can do. Thank you. Thank you, Matt and Mark. We really appreciate your participation today and, and the report that you guys put together. I want to remind everybody that you can uh, get your own copy of this uh, document uh, at acconline.org. So with that, uh, Matt, I'm going to turn, uh, Matt Griffin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Roddy. Uh, ACC would also like to express our appreciation to Mark, Matthew, and Roddy. Uh, we really appreciate your time and effort in this. Before we wrap up, just uh, one last minute, I wanted to make you all aware of some upcoming online training programs we're offering. We have a program uh, with the U.S. Trade and Development Agency and all the work that they do with international airports scheduled for April 19th. Also, we'll be reviewing the construction manager at risk procurement method on June 8th. Finally, there are a couple of events we'd like to bring to your attention. Please uh, register and make your hotel reservations for both the upcoming ACC Airports Technical Workshop, June 21st and 22nd, as well as the ACC TSA Security Capabilities Workshop, July 18th through the 20th. Both are in Arlington, Virginia. Registration is now open for both events on the ACC website at www.acconline.org. Finally, mark your calendars for the 39th ACC Annual Conference and Exposition, November 6th through 8th in San Diego, California. With that, uh, any additional questions, please follow up with any of us. Thanks for joining us. I think we got through all of our questions, but we'll go back and review. If we had any uh, that were left, we'll uh, pass it along to our um, presenters. Thanks again, and have a great afternoon.